Hey guys, more Blakey here and welcome back to another tutorial. This video marks the start of a new series where we create a full 2D platformer from start to finish with animations, multiple levels, menus, player deaths and more. This tutorial series is based for beginners but will most likely have some valuable knowledge somewhere in the videos for those of you who aren't just beginner level. Today we're going to be downloading Unity, creating the project and setting up some basic player movement. Very quickly before we begin, I just released a new free mobile game on the Google Play Store called Tappery. If any of my videos has helped you in the past and you'd like to return the favor or you just want to give it a try feel free to download the game via the first link in the description and if you're feeling generous even leave a review i would appreciate it if you enjoy the video make sure to like and subscribe and feel free to go and access all of the scripts from my videos if you subscribe to my patreon that can be found in the description now that is all out of the way let's get started to download unity head to unity.com forward slash download and then we're going to download the unity hub this is where we can download different editor versions as well as handle, open and create all of our projects. Firstly, we need to install an editor version. The most stable as of right now is 2021.3.20. This version has long-term support, meaning it's being actively updated. So let's go ahead and install that version. Before we install this version, let's make sure to also add a Windows build support and a Universal Windows platform build support. And if you want to publish to Mac, then you can also add the Mac build support module. By default, it will also install Visual Studio, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, let's press this blue button and create a new project and make sure it's on the version we just installed and give it a name. Once that's loaded, we officially have created a project. Now here we have our blank project. The first thing I'm going to do is head over to our game tab here and set the aspect ratio from free aspect to 16 by 9. Then we can see this reflect back in our scene tab with the shape of our camera here adjusting accordingly. Our hierarchy on the left is where our game objects in the level are going to be. The assets that we use for the project will be here in our project folder. And our inspector on the right here gives us details where we can adjust and view whatever current game object or asset is selected. So for the start of the series, we are going to create a player game object, create some basic player movement and a platform for our player to stand on. So first things first, what I'm going to do is import our player sprites. Now these sprites I made and I use for tutorials and other projects. They are available to download from one of the tiers on my Patreon, which is in the description. However, this is not mandatory. Feel free to find your own or use your own that you have made. And I'll leave some free ones that you can use in the description as well. So when working in 2D, and having animations we use things called sprite sheets now sprite sheets are these right here you can see there's a row of images very small and each individual image is a frame of the animation so for our player here i'm going to be selecting our idle animation i'm going to also select our running right animation so with these selected i'm going to drag these into my project folder and you can see they are now down here but very very small and the reason for this is because i'm working with pixel art and pixel art is naturally very very small these sprites are 16 by 16 pixels and if i was to drag this into our scene you can see it's absolutely tiny and if we were to zoom in it's also very very blurry so what we need to do is select our assets in the project folder and we need to change a few settings here to set it up to be ready to be used for animations and pixel art so first things first let's set the pixels per unit to 16 as each sprite like i mentioned is 16 by 16 and if i hit apply here immediately you can see it get way bigger but it is still very blurry and also it's all just one image at the moment but we're going to fix that so next we need to set the sprite mode from single to multiple because we're working with multiple sprites here and then we're going to go to our filter mode down here and set it from bilinear to point no filter and that is going to sharpen this sprite sheet up by a large amount if we hit apply here and by hitting apply and changing these settings it's actually going to make our sprite disappear so if we select it in the hierarchy you can see it says sprite missing so for now we can go ahead and get rid of this just by selecting it and press delete now back to our sprite sheet here and now the last thing we need to do here in our impulse settings is set the compression from normal quality to none now this works great for pixel art as it means we don't have any weird coloring or any discoloring so now let's go to our sprite editor here in the impulse settings and you can see we have this sprite right here now let's go right to the top and press slice now to minimize the risk of errors or losing work let's change the method of slicing from delete existing to safe and then let's change the type from automatic to grid by cell size back to safe we want to divide this by 16 by 16 so let's change that and now if we hit slice you can see these are all individually sliced into their own images all we need to do now is hit apply now if we select this little arrow you can see we have a bunch of separate sprites now and we can use these when we're creating our animations later on. So now we need to do this with our running animation, exactly the same settings as we did for this one. So again, let's change the sprite mode to multiple, the pixels per unit to 16, filter mode to point no filter and the compression to none. Hit apply and then go to our sprite editor, press slice, make sure our settings are set to exactly this. So 16 by 16, the method is safe and then hit slice again. 
and then hit apply. But what I am going to do now is create our player game object. Now I'm going to do this via one of our sprites because for this video we're not going to be making any animations. This is going to be just for the movement. But by dragging a sprite onto here it will create a game object and instantly we have a reference for what the general size of our player is going to be. So I'm going to open up my idle sprite sheet and just select any of the two sprites I've got here. Yours may have way more. Feel free to choose whatever one you want. And I'm just going to drag this onto our scene here. And you can see this creates a game object up here and all this game object is right now is just a sprite. Right. So first things first, let's rename it at the top of our inspector here and just call this player. And if we click on our game tab here, you can see we have our player right here. But if we do press play at the top here, you can see absolutely nothing happens. If I press any keys, we have no movement. Our player does not have any gravity applied. There is no platform. So let's fix all of those things now. First things first, let's give our player some gravity. So if we select this player, go to add component and type in rigid body 2D and then we just press enter. This will add a new component to our game object. So we now have a sprite renderer and a rigid body 2D, as well as our transform component we can use to adjust the position of our player. But this is what we're focusing on for the moment. Now, rigid bodies are used to allow game objects to react to real time physics when we press play. This also includes reactions to forces. So if we wanted to add a particular force to our player, we could do that and our rigid body will allow our game object to move and react depending on the force we've applied. Now, instantly, if we press play now, our player will fall through the sky and we can no longer see him. So now that we have that, let's create a platform that our player is going to land on so it doesn't fall for eternity. So again, to create a game object, we right click on our hierarchy or press the plus sign up here. Then we have a bunch of options for different game objects we could create. What we're looking for is 2D object, sprite, and then square. And straight away, you can see a square appears. Now for now, we are going to use this as a placeholder ground object. In future videos, we're going to create a tile map that's going to be a lovely grassy area for our player to walk across. I'm going to press T on my keyboard to bring up the transform tool. Then I'm going to click on one side and drag it and hold Alt while I do it. So it will drag equally on both sides. And then I'm just going to quickly rearrange this so it takes up the whole of the game scene. So I'm going to press W to bring up my transform tools. And then I'm just going to drag it slightly to the right here. So now we need to add a collider to this sprite and same for our player. Otherwise they will just pass through each other. Let's do add component box collider 2D, press enter. And you can see if you look hard enough, there's a very faint green line around this sprite. And if we press edit collider, we have these green dots here and I can drag them and rearrange our box collider just like this. If I zoom out a little bit, you can see the outline of the box collider here. So I'm just going to press Ctrl Z to undo that to make sure it fits exactly around our square. Now let's go back to our player and do the same. Let's add a box collider 2D. And you can see we have this green box, which fits the 16 by 16 sprite area we had for it. Now my sprite has these two little antennas that I don't want to include with my collider. So I can press edit collider and just drag that down to the actual body. So let's drag our player all the way to the top of the screen and then press play. If you have a keen eye, you may have noticed that our player actually phased through the ground a little bit when it landed. This is down to the rigid body collision detection. If it's on discrete, sometimes it will phase through the floor for a couple frames before it realizes it's actually collided with something. So let's change the detection from discrete to continuous. We also need to change the interpolate mode to interpolate. And if we hover over this, it says this handles the per frame update mode for the body. Setting this to interpolate means we can smooth out the effect of different physics that are in our game and it will smooth our player out to a fixed frame rate. So now if we press play, you can see our player drops but will instantly stop moving as the two colliders hit each other. So with our initial player set up out of the way, it's time we create a script on our player that we can use to make it move left, right and jump. So what we're going to do, we're going to click on our player here. We're going to scroll to the bottom in the inspector and press add component. And then we're going to type in player movement. We're going to press new script here and then create an add. Now, if we double click on this, it's going to open up Visual Studio. And now we have our empty script here. So before we actually start coding our movement, we need to reference a few components that we have attached to our player. So we're going to access our player's rigid body. So let's do private rigid body 2D, and we can just call this RB. So this isn't enough. We need to go into our start function, which is called just before our update function when the game first starts. And we're just going to set RB equal to get component rigid body 2D. So we've accessed our rigid body and set it to a private rigid body variable in our script here. Next, we need a float and we're going to call this private float move. And then we need another one for our speed. And this is the float that we're going to use to adjust our player speed in the inspector. So this can be a public float for speed. So now in our update function, which is running every frame, we're initially going to set our move float equal to input dot get axis raw. And you can see this is looking for a string and our string is our axis name. 
and this is set inside unity we have both horizontal and vertical and because this is a move float it's going to be horizontal because this is what we're going to use to move left and right but this isn't enough because we've assigned this float to move but we're not using this float anywhere so underneath this let's access our rigid body by doing rb and then let's access the velocity of that rigid body and we're going to set our velocity to a new vector 2 and our vector 2 is going to look for a x and y component so x is going to be our move float multiplied by our speed float and then for our y float we don't actually want to access our y value here so all we're going to do is set our y value to rb.velocity.y that means we're not actually changing anything here the only thing we're going to be accessing directly is our x float so now back in unity you can see on our player movement script we have a public field here for speed if I set this to something like 5 and then press play, I can use A and D on my keyboard to move left and right. So our movement is working correctly. So what we want to implement next is a jump value. So now in our update function, we're going to be checking for and play input. So if input dot get button down, we use get button down for pre-made strings that are in Unity. In our case, this is jump with a capital J. So these are pre-made when you set up the project, but you can change these if you want, but we'll go back to this when we head into the editor. So if down jump with a capital J, it's very important, then we're gonna add a false to our rigid body. And you can probably guess it's gonna be in the upwards direction. So let's do rb.addFalse. And now it's looking for a vector two for false. So we're gonna create a new vector two. And again, our vector two is looking for an X and a Y value. For our x, we do not want to change our x value, so we can just do rb.velocity.x. But for our y, we want to pass a float in, one that we don't have yet. So underneath our speed, let's create another public float for jumping. So let's do public float jump. We can then pass in that jump here and close this off with a semicolon. I'm also going to multiply this jump value by 10, just so we don't have to make this value as high in the editor. Back in Unity, we now have a public float for jump. Let's set this to something like 20 and then press play. And now if we jump with space, you can see we have a tiny little jump here and I can move around, jump left and right and move at the same time. So I just mentioned that Unity has some pre-made strings for us, which we can access in script. These are called axes and we can find these by going to edit, project settings and then input manager. Now for this project, we're gonna be using the normal input API. There is a new input system, but I'm gonna do this in a separate video. So these are all of the axes and in our script, so far we've used horizontal, which is here. And you can see that for our type, it's a key or mouse button. In our case, it's A and D and our arrow keys. For the axes, it's the X axes because we're moving left and right. And we also use jump here, which again is jump with a capital J. If you want, you could change the names of these, but you would have to change them in your script as well. For the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna keep them the same for this project. So you may want to do the same if you're following along with each video. So one thing you may notice about our movement is that it's very sharp. Turns are very sharp. There is no gradual increase and decrease in speed. And that is because the type of get axes we're using. We are using get axis raw. And you can actually see here, it says returns the value of the virtual axes identified by axes name with no smoothing filtering applied. Now we can use a different type just called get axes without the raw and this will have some smoothing applied and we can test this in the editor. You can see this is a little bit more smooth when we move left and right. There is a gradual increase and decrease in speed. Now because I'm using pixel art assets, I'm going to stick with get axis raw, but it's entirely up to you. So to wrap up this video, I'm gonna create some folders down in our project assets here, just to make sure that we maintain organization of our assets throughout the series. So what we can do here is right click, press create, and then go at the top to folder here. And I'm just gonna make one for scripts. I can then drag our scripts into here. And you may notice that if you reopen Visual Studio, you get this error. And this is simply because the script file path is now in a different place. And there is a very easy fix for that. And it's just reopening the script from Unity. And you can see it pops right back up. So let's do the same for our textures here. So I'm just gonna do folder, then sprites. And then I'm just gonna drag both of these in, just like that. And now we have a nice neat system and we'll create a few more folders as the series goes on when we need to. So right now, as you can see, we can actually infinitely jump, which is obviously not ideal. This is gonna be something we fix in the next two videos or so with a ground check. And I'm gonna show you two different ways we can do it in that video. But for now guys, that is it for episode one of our new 2D platformer tutorial. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. If you have any questions, leave them in the description below. If you want the scripts from this video, don't forget they are available from my Patreon. And finally, don't forget to check out Tappery from the link in the description description if you have access to the Google Play Store. I'll thank you all very much for watching today's video and I will see you all in the next one. Bye!